everyone, and welcome to our fourth installment of Water Safety Wednesday. Today we're going to be talking about the disability community and also about swimming in the disability community. And we have our special guests today, Dr. Monica Lepore. We have Bridget O'Leary Couture and her son, Warwick Couture. So Dr. Lepore is a professor emeritus after 37 years in professional preparation teacher education of health and physical educators at Westchester University of PA. Her area of expertise is adapted physical education and adapted aquatics and also sport camp programming for children with disabilities. Her educational background includes a BS in or a bachelor's in physical education and a master's in adapted physical education and a master's ED in special education and an ED in leadership and adapted physical education. She is currently the chair and author of the upcoming adapted aquatics instructor certification through Starfish Aquatics Institute and a member of the USA National Water Safety Plan Inclusion Subcommittee and the DIA Adapted Aquatics Committee. Her publications include books from Human Kinetics, Adapted Aquatics Programming, and Aquatic Assessment and Activities, and articles in Palestra focusing on physical activities, activity programs for children who are blind. Is currently a Special Olympics coach for swimming, basketball, and soccer, a Red, Qua a Red Cross water safety instructor, and is a recreational triathlete, mom, auntie, daughter, sister, and yoga instructor. Warwick Couture is a 13-year-old autistic teen who loves playing video games, reading, and acting. After a few mishaps, he learned to swim over two summers and enjoys spending time at the pool. When COVID isn't a thing, Bridget O'Leary is Warwick's mom, the, the full-time mom of two, Part-time worker bee in the B2B publishing industry is far from potient, proficient swimmer and made it one of her early goals to ensure her children would be comfortable and safe in the water. Awesome. So Dr. Lepore, um, I'll just start by asking you, is there a starting point to defining and understanding the disability community? And are there differences between visible and invisible disabilities? Thank you, Marie. Um, you can call me Monica. And I am going to answer that, of course, two separate different ideas since they are very different questions. Well, the disability community is not a monolith. So the beliefs, the needs, and the feelings of this community differ broadly. Um, but you can define the community by their shared needs. And what are the shared needs of people in the disability community? Number one is acceptance as a minority group. Number two is quality support, not only in school and employment, but in recreation and community activities. Um, they also share the need for moving away from oppression. Uh, you know, we don't talk about the word oppression very much these days. It seems like an old fashioned word, but, but the bottom line is that we just have new words for that uh, nowadays. Um, in terms of oppression. When, when people are left out of things, that's oppression. Uh, when people are discriminated against, even though it sounds fancy, that's being still being oppressed. Um, you can define this community with shared needs of um, things like accessibility. And a lot of people think that accessibility means like an electric door or a curb cut, but all people with disabilities have a variety of accessibility needs from print accessibility, how to access print um, things, um, to how to be able to access, uh, for example, um, a movie or a TV show, or like when you're at an amusement park, how to access things like the announcements or when you're in a you know, an airport or things like that. Um, or, you know, in the sw swimming community, is you know how to access things like when you are um, a single dad and you have a little girl and there's no family changing rooms for people with disabilities, that kind of access. So there's a lot of access kind of issues. And the, the disability community shares that as um, a shared need. Uh, also, um, stigmatization. The stigma of disability still kind of drags on today when people hear the word, a, a disability word, there's a stigma that are, already is coming from them um, as negative. 
Um, and also something that's a really interesting thing is this inspiration porn, you would call it. And that is when people without disabilities use people with disabilities as an inspiration and it's very inspiring. So they use that, they use that to like objectify people with disabilities. Like, oh, if they can do it, I should be able to do it and things like that. Or, or things that you see like, um, a person with no legs swimming against a person with two legs during a high school swim meet. And then there's this whole idea of, I got beat by a person with one leg kind of thing. So the disability community is very di diverse in its needs and beliefs and feelings, but there are some common things that unite them. And mostly it's um, trying to continually fight for acceptance. Um, but I would say the starting point um, uh, is to listen to the community of people with disabilities themselves, authentic voices, not some group of um, people that are speaking for people with disabilities, but the people with disabilities themselves, authentic voices versus people speaking for them. So this is a starting point on how to uh, understand disability community. Um, get to know people with disabilities who are um, activists and research what issues they're talking about. Um, also study these issues. What vernacular, what words do people with disabilities themselves identify with? Um, and continue to listen to what words evolve because we know that that is something that happens um, is that wording evolves um, with all communities. Um, also, what are people with disabilities asking us as non-disabled people to what should our role be as an ally? You know, what actually should we, how do we be allies? Um, also following the nothing about us without us. And um, that is a slogan used to communicate the idea that no policy, no decisions should be made about people with disabilities unless they are fully represented and listen to and have full participation of members of the disability group that we're talking about. Um, this is a really interesting slogan, nothing about us without us. Other um, groups have taken that, but it really uh, it was a disability rights movement slogan um, that is very important to the, to the people with disabilities. And lastly, exploring disability practices, policies, politics, and culture. Um, by reading articles, listening to speeches by self-advocates and self-activists are other ways. Watching documentaries that, that have authentic voices and becoming a part of the disability community as an ally and getting to know a variety of people with disabilities and asking them how we could be allies to them are important. Monica. What is autism and what is intellectual disabilities? Thank you, Falu. Um, I think I might have to go back because I didn't answer the second part of the question. So hold on for one second. The second part of the question was, are there differences between invisible and visible disabilities? Well, definitionally, of course, there is a difference between visible and invisible disabilities. And when we see a person with a disability, a lot of times people who don't know that person automatically start to think a narrative in their head about what that means. And that doesn't happen with an invisible disability. Unless the person with an invisibility, invisible disability does something that's kind of non-normative. And then that narrative begins even bigger. Like, why is that person doing that non-normative thing? So yes, an invisible disability and a visible disability you know, have a lot of differences, of course, um, but a lot of times people with invisible dis disabilities who we call pass, who pass, um, actually get to then experience them, you know, the rest of their personality. Let me give you an example. If I was talking to a person who was a, a person with a limb difference, okay, maybe they had only one arm, and I spent eight weeks every day talking to them on the phone and we didn't talk anything about disability. And then I met them for coffee. I already have in my head what kind of person they are to me already. 
they what kind of um you know are they nice you know are they intellectual i have a, a basis of that based on the fact that i didn't know they had a disability so when i then go to meet them and it's a visible thing um a lot of times people with visible disabilities get um get stereotyped very quickly before you can get to know the person um but in reality um most people with invisible and and visible disabilities need similar things inclusion equity accessibility and acceptance so in that way those are things that the whole community needs so falu you asked me a question would you ask it again for me what is what are intellectual disabilities okay so the question is what is autism and what is intellectual disabilities so again two different questions and i'd like to answer um that question a little differently um well first of all both are what's called developmental disabilities they are things that affect your growing up and developing and they affect a lot of times your milestones so when you speak when you roll over when you walk when you run when you say your first word when you look at somebody and have reciprocal conversation um so that is that is a typical thing that's the same okay so they're both developmental disabilities um but autism is a sp spectrum disorder that causes some um differences in socialization communication sometimes behavioral things we see people with autism or autistic people those are two ways to approach that terminology um they possibly learn in a way that is not the same as others they may think and problem solve in a unique manner um they may communicate and interact in a way that seems different than children without autism um some autistic people have intellectual disabilities some do not some people might be verbal some might not some people with autism may have secondary disabilities like attention deficit hyperactivity or bipolar disorder or um o OCD so that autism is a picture of itself versus intellectual disability so intellectual disability um according to the American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities is significant limitations in um intellectual functioning okay so usually when we talk about intellectual functioning we're talking about like IQ your intellectual quotient your functioning intellectually um and also skills in adaptive behavior like um i guess you would say like problem solving and understanding concepts practical skills everyday life skills so to have a kind of um somebody put a, a diagnosis on you as id intellectual disability you have to score a certain um under a certain number in an iq test and have issues with um learning reasoning problem solving uh occupational everyday living skills um, um and functional academics and things like that now some people with autism have intellectual disabilities some do not some people with intellectual disabilities have autism some do not so they are two separate things sometimes occurring at the same time hey warwick what does autism and awareness and acceptance mean to you thank you polo so uh autism awareness to me means learning about autism and autism acceptance means allowing people who, for who they are thanks warwick um so monica we were wondering what are your experiences working with people who have disabilities in swimming and in the swimming community so teaching swimming to people with disabilities and teaching swim instructors how to teach people with disabilities is my whole career my whole life it, it's 42 years of my my life um i i think we have time for a quick story but when i was a, a college student and i was working at a camp as an aquatic director um what the director came back to like our first week of training before the summer began and said oh by the way this new law has passed that says 
children with disabilities will now go to their local schools. And so I thought, why wouldn't we want to have children with disabilities come to camp then? So I've invited several children with disabilities per session to join us in what's called at that time mainstreaming, right? And we all looked at each other like, what? Well, we don't know what to do. And she was like, well, they're children. You know how to teach. There you go. So I remember that being like my introduction to feeling it was really interesting because I was lucky that I didn't feel like the child had needs. I felt I had needs. I had the need to figure out what I was supposed to be doing. How was I going to support and serve this child? And that has helped me my whole life not to put a blame on the child for not being able to do something. And that has really helped me pick this as my career, knowing that I was the one who needed to figure out what are the strategies that needed to happen? What are some fun things to do to encourage this child to do the various things I wanted them to do in the pool? So that summer, I really learned a lot. And, and I also learned not to set the bar low. Um, my experiences are uh, working in inclusive settings with children without, with and without disabilities, like in summer camps. Um, I also, for about 33 years, ran a program at the university where I taught my students how to work with kids in the pool and in the gym too. Um, I've been an aquatic director for camps for kids who are blind, and I currently still am a Special Olympics swim coach when COVID is not around. Um, so I have a bunch of those experiences. Um, also from a higher level, um, I've written a few books. I'm doing a research project right now um, with uh, diversity and aquatics. And also I have a lot of experience giving presentations about this topic. So it's what I like to study. It's what I like to do. And every time I'm with a young person or an older person with disability in the pool, I try to figure out something else like and learn something else. Like, hmm, I wonder how, what it would be like to try to get them to do a side stroke when they've never done that. And they don't even understand what it means to go from your side. So that's my experience. Auric, what skills did you and your classmates learn from swim lessons? I learned about the scoops, the uh, front crawl, the backstroke, both um, the butterfly kicks, you name it, we've done it. Again, another question for you. Do you remember how those skills were taught differently in the special needs lessons compared to the mainstream lessons? Thank you, but Lou, and uh, in the special needs class, as they taught you how to do it step by step, whereas in the mainstream world, they just toss you out there and expect you to do it yourself. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Bridget. Um, we're just wondering what advice would you give for other parents, guardians, or caretakers of children with disabilities in aquatic settings? I had a an answer all planned out in my head. Open my mouth, nothing's coming out. Um, I think the, the most important thing is to make sure your kids are safe and to know what that looks like for your family. Not being a strong swimmer myself, but knowing that Warwick loved, loved, loved water at a very young age, um, it was imperative that I found ways to keep him safe before he could swim. He's coming up at a, at a time where autism is in the news a lot more often, and you're hearing about the good and the bad. But when he was two, three, four, five, six years old, it felt like every third week, I was hearing a news story about a child with autism having eloped from their house, having eloped from a situation, run off, the parents lost track of them, they loved water, and then they were found floating in a, in a pond or in a pool or something, and nine out of 10 times they did not survive. And so my fears as a first time mom with a kid with a disability that I didn't know anything about, I worried. Um, tremendously. So the first thing I did when I felt that I could get him to the point, let's let's try swim lessons, was to start exposing him in ways that could keep him safe. Start getting him into classes that he would learn to be safe in the water. Took a few tries to find the right fit for us, um, but we did. And once once I knew he could be safe, then I was like, okay, let's actually learn teaching him how to swim. Let's get him the, the skills to swim. Um, we were very lucky where we are. He has some very good friends um, that when we would have play dates either like at Lake Anna or 
in other at the pool or in more specifically in private pools at, at somebody's house his friends all knew he couldn't swim so they were always they were very good work why don't you use the floaty why don't you you know take the floaty or they would make sure they would play in the shallow end but if they wanted to go in the deep end they would make sure he was safe first and one time the last summer before he before we finally found a fit for us he was on a floaty device and he floated into the deep end and he started to panic because he knew that if anything happened he was going to be stuck and immediately three of his friends swam out to him grabbed that floaty and pulled him back into the, the shallow end and i immediately turned to the moms and said what do i do where do i go for swim lessons and these were moms of children who were not disabled and so talking to them in that situation they were like start here this is where we went start here and maybe they can help you and so definitely my advice is find a place that you feel comfortable taking your children taking definitely a, a child who has a disability but also any siblings and if it can if it would be a good fit for at least the one that needs it the most then work around that and make sure that everybody is safe um, because i could not foresee having play dates or arranging an outing to a river a lake a pool with only one of my children being safe. They both needed to be safe because I can't be in two places at one time. That's great advice, thank you. Um, now, Monica, we're wondering what are some of the risks people with intellectual disabilities and or autism in aquatic settings face? And how do those risks differ from the risks the rest of the population faces within those same spaces? Well, I'm gonna talk about the words like higher incidence. So when we say the word higher incidence, of course, we mean that differs from the normative population or let's say the non-disabled population, right? Okay, so we know, as Bridget said, there is a higher rate of drowning in kids with autism. So the fact that War could swim, he has already like knocked himself out of that issue because he now is not going to be in a high risk situation because he knows how to swim already. So um, kids with autism have 160 times more likely to drown than their peers, 160. Some literature suggests it's the number one drowning. Uh, drowning is the number one cause of death in children 14 and under with autism. Some suggest it's accidental death as the number one with, with um, drowning being part of that accidental death. So sometimes, you know, you, you read different things, um, but the bottom line, it's either the number one or the closest to number one cause of death in 14 year olds and younger who have autism. Um, so those people with autism and intellectual disabilities, not like you don't have to have autism and intellectual, and intellectual people with autism and people with intellectual disabilities um, both have a higher incidence of epilepsy, um, especially as children with autism get towards puberty and get into the pubescent, they, a lot of kids start to have seizures. And um, those with seizures and epilepsies have a higher risk of drowning than the typical population. So now put that all together. Let's talk about something that Bridget um, mentioned. She mentioned elopement, you know, uh, running away. Um, that sounds too negative. Um, moving away from where you're supposed to be, okay? Because when you say running away, it sounds like it's very, like you have the ability to control that, okay? So we have young people with autism who may be in an overstimulated area and elope and get away from that area so that they can regulate their own sensory needs. So another one is wandering, okay? So wandering is different than elopement. Elopement means actually let's get away from this because this is too much for me or that somebody is, you know, being uh, unkind. Um, whereas wandering means just a lot of exploring way, way, way from everybody else. Um, so wandering and elopement are two of the issues that um, like Bridget mentioned, that we deal with where one second you're there, one second you're not. Um, and if you are at the lake or at wherever, or there is any kind of body of water near you, um, especially, you know, you're at a picnic or a recreational activity, um, that is when uh, a lot of children uh, with autism get into difficulties. So here's another issue. In general, people with autism have difficulty generalizing skills from 
I'm gonna say swimming, from the swim class to the open water or whatever other area that you are in. So you learn to swim in my in the pool and we do this every week for 14 weeks and then you go on vacation to the Outer Banks and a wave comes and knocks you down and the generalization of that skill is not always uh, apparent, okay? So um, also the lack of specialized services. Do you know that, all right, kids with autism are kids. So we should be able to teach them, okay? But because sometimes kids with autism present some challenges to instructors that don't have a big set of skills, they sometimes are turned away or I can't teach this kid or the, uh, the adaptation is not made. Um, and you mean the talk of that we're talking about adaptations that are not rocket science here. Okay. We're talking about using a whiteboard and writing down the five things that they're supposed to do that day, or, you know, finding out what is the biggest motivator for that child and, and integrate it into every single thing that you're saying, um, working with the parents, uh, caregivers to find out what is their reinforcement system. You know, that's not rocket science that's teaching. <laughs> so, um, where was I? Okay, lack of specialized services. Now, if Ward decides it, that he's gonna be in a class when he's four years old with 12 other young people, that might not be his best match for him. And that's an easy fix, but it's not an easy fix if the structure and the system is very ableist. Like this is what we do and this is how we do it, okay? So, um, you know, breaking down that structure uh, is, is really important. Generally, just a lack of training of general swim instructors and coaches to know what what is the best practice for, for young people with autism in the water. You know, that general lack of training, and that's where I'm working at in my retirement now. I am gonna be putting out um, with Starfish Aquatics, I'm gonna be putting out a new instructor certification for uh, all disability. But um, if this wasn't COVID, it would be here right now. Um, two more things, uh, difficulty with perceiving danger. There's a lot of people with intellectual disabilities or with autism who don't perceive danger the same as maybe me, okay? So I might be able to look and look around and I can see from the environment that all the kids are screaming and running out of the water so I can perceive that there's probably something dangerous there. Yeah, maybe a fish, that biting fish, or maybe there's some glass on the ground. But sometimes if you have difficulty with um, some type of comprehension of concept concepts, you might not say like, you might say to yourself, oh good, they're getting out, I'm going in, right? Um, and lastly, there are some people with autism or intellectual disabilities that kind of just lack this awareness of their surroundings. Some of the kids that I work with, they can, you know, like run across the pool deck and they will knock over all the cones, walk on top of the flotation devices, just because they are thinking about getting in the pool. You know, they're not thinking about what's under their feet. And in terms of how do those risks differ, Typically, when as a swim instructor, I tell my non-disabled kids, you know, hey, when you're on the pool deck, you're gonna walk on the black line all the way across and then sit on the side of the pool. Typically, they follow that. And, and sometimes people with autism really just wanna get in the pool and they have this innate need to do it right now. And sometimes those rules kind of get pushed aside. Again, not like thinking, I'm going to make this teacher angry. Just thinking, if you think of the word autism, it means self, inside self. So just thinking inside myself, I'm at the pool. I'm going in the pool. So thank you. Monica, how do we make aquatic spaces more inclusive for people with disabilities? And how can this be done at the competitive level? So I think the competitive level, I'm not quite sure if I have a perfect answer for that, but I'm gonna give you my best, best try answering the question in general, because in general, we are talking about a social justice issue here. 
Um, and that crosses every piece of every level. So um, just like most social justice movements, making inclusive spaces for everyone is to look at programmatic things and architectural things and have them look from a universally designed lens. Let me give you a, a, um, a more specific. Let's say that war does much better with maybe only two people in his class. So instead of me creating a whole program and when war comes, I have to adapt for him, I've already thought in my head, wait, you know, as we build this program, those with some more sensory needs need to have smaller groups. Let's write that down in our plan. Not when Bridget and War walk in and kind of sort of demand that they need a reasonable accommodation. That should have been thought of already. So that's looking at something through a universally designed lens is looking at something again from looking at everybody that might use this aquatic facility or be on this team or be in these lessons, not writing a plan and saying, oh, wait, you deviate from this? You need to take the lift to get in? Oh, how are we gonna do that? That's in the wrong lane. That's a really, <laughs> I'd say that's the number one way to make an inclusive space is to think of everyone beforehand and have all of those things thought out already. So it's matter of fact. It's a matter of fact that people autism love to swim. It's a matter of fact that people in wheelchairs need to want to go in the pool. It's a matter of fact that those people with Down syndrome um, would like to be on the swim team. It's just a matter of fact. Um, so one of my favorite websites is called The Body Is Not An Apology. So the next seven, six tips are from the website The Body Is Not An Apology. So one is make sure everybody can get in the door. That's talking about architectural accessibility. So when we talk about how to make aquatic spaces uh, more inclusive for people with disabilities, the number one thing is you got to be able to get in the door. So, um, you know, is there abilities uh, to move within floors, um, you know, with an elevator? Um, is there is there ramps instead of stairs? Are there um, lower light switches and um, and and do they have a do they just have the ability to get from the parking lot into the building? Just, can you get in? Second is make sure everyone's message can reach others. So if you are at a, a round table of how this particular aquatic facility or team or program could be more inclusive, we would assume that you're gonna call people with a lot of disabilities to the table. And when they do come, what are you going to do when someone is a nonverbal person? How are they going to express themselves? How are you going to include everyone in the conversation? Um, people who um, uh, who are deaf, who need an interpreter, like how are you going to make sure everyone's voice is heard? Also, it's don't stigmatize non-normative behavior. Um, this requires a big compassion and approach because when somebody is in the pool and is very excited and is nonverbal, they may screech. And that non-normative behavior needs to um, just have a compassionate approach to it. You know, if I said, when I finally went underwater for the first time, that was great. Nobody would tell me, be quiet. But if I came up and I went, ah! they might say, oh, keep your voice down, okay? So, um, Another th thought from the body's not an apology. Understand that the disability community is as diverse as every community. So that's a really important piece. So um, I think that, that we need to continue to look at that um, as, as an important thing. And bringing somebody in a wheelchair into the round table does not speak for everybody with a disability. Um, let people with disabilities speak for themselves and determine how to best serve their own needs. We are really starting to move away from that, but there are some organizations that still continue to try to be a voice for people with disabilities, even as uh, we start having many, many self-advocates um, in, in, the, in the community. Um, and last, avoid language that further marginalizes disabled people. Like make sure no one's lived experience is used as a metaphor. For example, you saying like, I'm so blind to that idea. You're deaf to what I'm saying. You know, using those kind of things 
some of these lived experiences a metaphor not very cool also most people with disabilities do not want to be called differently abled they don't want to be called any kind of euphemisms that make us non-disabled people feel a little bit better about that um, people with disabilities identify as either identity first language i'm autistic or they identify as individuals first language i'm a person with down syndrome or i'm a person with autism listen ask and follow thank you very much bridget what was your expectation of swim instructors providing water safety education to your child i think when we first started i just wanted them to teach my kid how to swim but i very quickly learned that I was expecting, I don't think I, I consciously thought about it, but I was expecting them to be patient because one, he was a child and two, he was a child with a disability. And I was upfront with everybody about that every time we started a swim program. And that was usually the first question I asked. Uh, we started him in swim lessons at four, I think three-ish, four-ish. And one of the first questions I asked was, you know, can you accommodate a child with autism? And every place I went, oh, sure, 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 sure we can, sure we can. And the first place was not a good fit for him at all. They assured me that their instructors were versed in teaching children with disabilities. And if need be, we could put them in private lessons. Private lessons are expensive. Some lessons in general are not exactly cheap, but private lessons at a private facility are more expensive. Um, so when that wasn't working out as well as I would have liked, um, my next thought was I need to have a program for him that can definitely meet his needs to meet him where he is. Uh, luckily for us, we have a very good parks and rec program and they had classes built specifically for children with disabilities. And while I would make some changes to that program, it was exactly what we needed to get him to break through some of those aspects that were holding him back, some of those sensory issues that he was struggling with that were preventing him from learning to swim. And um, then when we bridged him from those lessons to lessons that are more general public lessons, it happened, it just was a fluke, it was a happenstance. The head lifeguard came to me that first day and she was laughing and she said, uh, he's the only one in the class because at this point in the season, most of the kids had moved on and it was just happenstance. He had the same teacher for his regular classes as he had had for his special needs classes. So not only was there consistency, um, the teacher knew him and knew how he worked and he couldn't try to pull one over on that one teacher about he didn't know how to go underwater. That teacher was like, I know you can submerge, go get the ring. And that teacher at that point also kind of was had knew, knew how far he could push or when work was starting to get overwhelmed. Um, and in all in the, the the situation that worked best for us it was also I could sit full side and if the teacher was struggling to reach work, he could look to me and I could say, okay, hang on, give me a minute, let me talk him down, let me calm him down, or I could intervene and just say, hey, why don't we try this? Give him a break. Let's do this instead. Um, so even if it wasn't a matter of training, it's not that the young man wasn't trained. It was just a one specific case or a, an off case here and there that I would need to intervene. So I was really just wanting him to learn how to swim was what I went in with, but patience from the teachers and the willingness to learn about the kids individually, um, like, because you can't teach them. They're not all the same child. My, my two kids learn very differently. I've had to <laughs> remind my daughter about that a few times that they're not going to be just because it's easy for her doesn't mean it's going to be easy for her brother and vice versa. Um, so from a mom perspective, I think most parents would want somebody who's going to be able to look at their kid as an individual and as a young individual trying to learn to swim, somebody who is learning and not going to necessarily get it the first time or two or three or sometimes seven or eight times and just have that patience to not give up on them. I'd like to piggyback on something Bridget is, is saying from the instructor standpoint. So one of the things that's a little bit different that about when I teach my peeps with autism or intellectual disability or any disabilities um, that I want um, a direct line to the parents and a lot of in, you, you've heard a lot of coaches and instructors say oh those parents leave them let them get out blah 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 you know i know sometimes there's interference but i would say nine out of ten nine and a half out of ten times my relationship with the family has sustained me to be able to do what i need to do as the instructor and the coach um 
you know, I'll try my five different things, my 10 different things, but now I need you, mom and dad. I need you to tell me, I need the carrot. I need, I need you. So as a, a college professor, one of the important things for me is that I teach my students how to communicate with parents. That's one of the objectives of our whole, like our whole program is, is to understand how to communicate. What wording would you like to use if, you know, and we, we say, I say this to my college students. I say, I want you to think about the little kid that you love the most in your life. Think about them. And now think about if I wrote this in a, in an email. Um, Bob can't jump in the pool. Okay. Well, all right. Maybe he can, and maybe Bob just hasn't done that for you yet. So that'll be really embarrassing for you when mom or dad say he jumps off the pool deck at the Y every day. So let's figure out a way like, so as of this point, Bob has not jumped into the pool during our program. Okay. But that's one thing. So the, uh, and the other thing is just having instructors to not feel that they need to know everything right then. And for them to be able to say, you know what, I'm, it kind of looks like they're making fun of me when they laugh in my face and spit water in my face. And that's making me very sad and a little bit angry. Can you help me through this? So when you empower parents to help you help their child, they'll spend all day and all night with you. <laughs> so those are my two things in terms of um, instructors. And also I wish that instructors would continue to think that they need to learn instead of like, oh, I got my water safety instructor certificate. I just have to teach to renew it. And I know everything. So um, yeah, thanks for letting me share that. Thank you for adding to that. And um, our final question goes to Warwick. Um, of all the swim instructors you've had, what kind of teaching styles helped you want to learn the most? Were there things some teachers did that made it easier or more fun to learn to swim? Was it easier or harder being in classes with kids who didn't have autism or other disabilities? Just describing that experience would be really helpful for us. Thank you, Marie. So uh, of all swim instructors, I'm gonna have for the I'm gonna have to choose with somebody named Mr. Nathan. He so for the second question, he made he made the style of swimming sort of different scenarios. Like for the breaststroke, may look like said to look like a frog swimming in the water. And for the scoops, he was like like scoop in like like a spoon scooping for ice cream. And uh, for the third question, it was definitely harder for harder being in classes with the normal kids. They they are the ones who don't understand and the hand about my um, my troubles being in the water. Thank you. I was just gonna I was gonna ask you that war. I was wondering what you liked better. Did you like the like maybe smaller class where it was like more special? Yeah, I like I like the smaller classes. That's awesome. So maybe another thing that swim instructors might need to do is maybe teach kids without autism. What are some of the needs that you may have and how to address them? They might Perfect. need a little bit of instruction, right? Yeah. What would you say to the other kids who don't have autism for them to understand you while you're in the swim class with them? What would you say? I'd say like, if you see, if you see me, see me if you see me with the did you see me like tapping on the on the sides I, I have I have some sort of thing that helps me help me focus good so you're gonna explain to these other kids what you're doing when you're over there kind of like you got to go to the wall for a second because you're gonna maybe do your focusing and they're thinking that you're just goofing off but you told them that, hey, this is what I need to stay focused. So very nice. That's called self-advocacy. I wish you a lot of luck. Good luck. Thank you, Warwick. I think it's really helpful for people to be able to hear how to, how to learn and how to make these spaces more comfortable. And so again, I wanna thank all of you for, for coming and talking with us. Um, we really were able to get a full experience, experience with the community and also 
understanding more more of the background so that we can again create a space that's more welcoming um so thank you again and um just a reminder for our viewership that we will be posting these every wednesday um and that this is all in preparation for international water safety day which is on may 15th where we'll be breaking the guinness world record for the most people treading at once and anyone can participate so check out our website and um, if you want to participate, email tread at drowningawareness.org. And um, thank you for coming. All right.